matter what hour your clock strikes here, it's always Halloween, and I'm always your haunted host, Luce Tomlin Brenner. Today, I'm featuring a very special episode with horror costume designer Emma Kogan, and we're going to talk about the psychology and design that goes into not only creating an iconic horror look, but an even more long-lasting Halloween costume. This week, the Lantern's Way started flying out to people's homes, of course, magically arriving with a broomstick. Thank you so much to Joe Carlo, who has been on the layout, the design, the printing, the shipping end of things. To me, the hardest end of things. Could not do this without him and Displace Snail, my co-collaborators on the Lantern's Way. And of course... 60 pages, more than 60 pages, packed full of photographs, recipes, history, memories, all from lanterns like you around the world. So this is your must-have lantern Halloween accessory this Halloween. Make sure you order that if you haven't yet. It's going to be on his website for a while because, as we know, it's always Halloween. So don't feel like the 31st is your deadline. But if you want to have it before the 31st, make sure to head to DisplacedSnail.com. That link you can find in the show notes, on the Instagram, on the Patreon, wherever fine links are sold. So make sure you get your copy. uh, Make sure you place an order now to get it before calendar Halloween. And I'm just really excited. I've been in tears over it because it's so gorgeous. There's little sneak peeks on Display Snail's Instagram and on our Instagram as well. So if you haven't received your copy as of this recording, you can get a sneak peek on the Instagram. All right, let's jump in to this illuminating conversation with Emma Kogan. And make sure to stick around because the two of us will be co-diving deep into the darkest corners of the eek mailbag. Costume designer Emma Kogan, it's such a thrill to have you here. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. And you're actually here here. I am here here. I am right next to you. Yeah, I had to take the pod (laughs) closet and turn it into the pod bedroom. Yes. (laughs) Because two of us weren't going to fit in there. (laughs) I feel very immersed into the always Halloween experience. You are immersed. Uh, There's Halloween boxes all around us. It's sort of like a Halloween fort. Yeah, it's like method podcasting. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, first sit in this giant bucket of decorations (laughs) that I've been in too much pain to put up with. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I'm loving it. You have not one kind of Halloween tape, but multiple kinds of Halloween tapes, like just in case. I do. Yeah, I have a stack of Halloween duct tape, uh, (laughs) jack-o'-lanterns, candy corn, scary branches. I love it. Thank it's you. So <laughs> um, well, I love you. You're a very close friend of mine. I admire your work so much. I met you by tracking you down at a film festival <laughs> and trying to make you become friends with me, and it worked. It worked. You tricked me. Yes. I, <laughs> your witchy spell. That's the trick and trick or treat. <laughs> Um, So let me introduce you to our lovely lanterns who I know are going to fall in love with you as I have. So Emma Kogan is a horror focused filmmaker, costume designer, art director and co-creator of the queer feminist horror collective Monstrous Femme Films. With a penchant for surreal, retro and technicolor visuals, Emma's work utilizes stylized genre film as a backdrop for exploring the twisted side of the human condition, juxtaposing camp with the macabre. Emma is currently writing her next film, Penny and the Poppies, a queer, retro-surrealist psychological horror set in the swinging 60s, slated for release in 2023, marking Emma's return to directing. Her latest film, which she produced, art directed, and costume designed, is Baby Fever, a 70s prom pro-choice body horror, and it's making the festival rounds now, which is why I'm so lucky to get to sit with you because the weekend that we're recording, Baby Fever is making its LA debut at one of the largest genre festivals in the world, Scream Fest. Congratulations. Thank you so much. We are, it doesn't feel real. Like, (laughs) I mean, we just, 
you know, we worked really hard on it for um, a few years, just sort of hoping that, you know, the sacrifices of indie filmmaking would, would pay off. And we were really hoping to get into this one. So we're just, we're super stoked to be here. And any excuse to come to LA and visit you? Ah, uh, <laughs> I'll make, I'll pretend that it was more about me than yeah. this huge prestigious honor. Yeah. <laughs> Luce first, Screen Fest second. But we're very excited to be there. We're actually going tonight. So we'll yeah. be at Screen Fest tonight, watching Baby Fever. Um, yeah, in the iconic Chinese theater, which is like the craziest part. Exactly, which was um, one of the earliest movie palaces that uh, theater magnet uh, Grauman built. Uh, he also did the Egyptian theater in Hollywood, the Million Dollar Theater downtown, which is really close to where I live. And the El Capitan, which is now owned by Disney, but is also across the street from the Chinese theater. So you and all of Monstrous Femme Films are going to be officially a part of prestigious L.A. theater history. <laughs> what can we say? <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very excited for this premiere. Saturday night, 10 p.m. premiere spot is very flattering. So it's, good job. Yes. Thank you so much. It's, it's an honor. We're excited. We're going to be screening with a ton of really amazing um, indie filmmakers that will be at the festival too. And I'm just excited to meet everyone and like meet new faces and say hi and hang out with like-minded people with really crazy tastes in film. <laughs> yeah, especially because it is the Halloween season, which is what's yes. so great about this festival happening here. Yeah, absolutely. It's like perfect. Um, and, you know, Emma and I actually work together on my film, Surprise, uh, which Emma also produced and did all the art direction and all the costuming for that as well. So if mm. you have seen the photos from Surprise, then a lot of that style comes from Emma's insanely beautiful brain. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're so welcome. <laughs> um, so let's get into some... I have oodles of questions about costume designing. I think you have this natural way of understanding what's in people's brains. That's my experience. I have so much visual stuff happening in my brain all the time, but sometimes I have trouble getting it out with my words. And so I did a lot of free association with you mm -hmm. when talking about costuming. Yeah. And one of the things like, I feel like we bonded really quickly was I said a lot of like words and uh, since you just like photographs of other films that I liked. And from that, I felt like you plucked out uh, what I was thinking of, which is <laughs> really I magical. was actually reading your mind. Oh, my God. Yeah. I love that you have that skill. Yeah, it's actually that's the skill I have. Should I... we be talking about you being telepathic then <laughs> instead of a costume designer? <laughs> would that be more? Maybe that would be more interesting. That's actually yeah. a lot more interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I am really curious to know. Oh, wait. First, I have a deeply meaningful and very important question we have yeah. to start with. Yeah. Emma, please tell all the lanterns, when is your birthday? Oh, well, my birthday is on everyone's least favorite holiday on this podcast, Halloween. Oh, my God. I thought you were going to say the C word and I started panicking. <laughs> You're like, oh, my God, wait, did we get this all wrong? <laughs> um, Your birthday is on Halloween. You're a Halloween yeah, baby. It's always Emma's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'll change the name of the podcast yeah. to. <laughs> That's so cool. So did you just like come out of the womb loving Halloween? Did your parents love Halloween? I, gosh, you know, my mom loves a theme. <laughs> like she really does. Um, she definitely got me into my thrift hoarding. Huh. You know, her she had she goes through phases where sometimes she wants to collect a bunch of owls from the thrift store. And sometimes <laughs> that, but when it's Halloween, she will collect a bunch of pumpkin things. That's cool. So that definitely informed my experience. I've always loved Halloween, um, but or I just always loved myself. Yes, and <laughs> I always love my birthday. They're like completely and, interchangeable, right? Yeah. Like, do you feel like you are Halloween? I am. Yeah. No, I am this holiday. This holiday <laughs> is me. Everyone around the world is celebrating Emma. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Emma Ween. Exactly. <laughs> um, do you feel like you being born on Halloween and like having the celebrations, like obviously it it made you like the holiday more, but did that push you towards horror films and working in horror films and costuming? Because like costuming for film is so deeply connected to costuming oneself for mm -hmm. Halloween or even cosplay. Yeah, I think that it, you know, when I really think about it, I'm like, there's no way that 
not, you know, that, that, that there's, there's no way that this wouldn't have an impact on my influences and what I am doing now as an adult, because it's so like what I'm doing is so oddly specifically linked to Halloween, especially when it comes to costuming and then making horror, but then the intersection of both and my fascination with both. Um, when did that start for you? Gosh, I think that I, I mean, always loved dressing up, of course. Like that was something I was always really fascinated with. Um, and I think that I also just always loved spooky media. So I think that my interest in horror um, kind of came from that, which I think came from my dad wanting to show me scary things for Halloween. Yeah. Um, Did you have a gateway movie for me? I talk about sometimes uh, Return to Oz. Ooh, yeah. Was a big gateway for me. And then like Halloween specials like Garfield's Halloween Mm -hmm. or the Roseanne Halloween episodes of television. Oh, iconic. (laughs) Yes. I definitely think that... um, like TV specials for sure probably were like the earliest gateways. Um, gosh, nothing super specific early, early on. Probably just, oh, I mean, Scooby Doo, I guess for me, for sure. I can see that, especially because of your love for things that are like 60s and 70s. Mm-hmm. Are you excited that Velma is officially out? Oh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Like we know. We've always <laughs> known. I'm, I'm glad that she's she's getting that um, stamp of approval, the verification. Exactly. The, um, the femme for femmes, we're always yeah. aware. <laughs> yeah, we know. <laughs> but um, yeah, for sure. I mean, and I think that an older, um, older Emma, maybe like 13, 14 year old Emma. Actually, that's a lie. I don't think I was that young when this came out or when. When did it come out? I was going to say Orphan is probably when I started to get into more like modern horror or when I when I considered it past just like silly, goofy things or right. like cartoons or um, like whatever came on the TV. Yeah. Whatever silly, scary thing came on the TV. You know, I like mysteries and spooky books and whatnot. But um, I feel like Orphan was the first time I saw like a psychological horror that really genuinely terrified me. Did you see it in the theater? I did see it in the theater. And it was amazing. And I would force my friends to watch it like every week. That was me with The Sixth Sense. That was like the first major horror movie I saw in the theater. And it felt scary, just Mm -hmm. dangerous almost to like be going to Mm -hmm. it. And then I did, I took multiple people. I'm like, we have to go see. I probably saw it like three or four times in the theater. Oh, yeah. I love it. And I think at that era, I was really into like any horror film that came out in theaters from that point on. Like I just wanted to go see them all. And then I started getting more into... um, the like older horror and stuff that you know because I think that older horror initially when I would see it it didn't scare me as much because I felt like when I was like a kid it didn't um you know and I'm thinking like like you know universal pictures like 40s sure it doesn't like show you anything you haven't necessarily seen before it doesn't challenge what you know about the world yeah and I think when you're really young sometimes it you're not like I feel like as a kid I didn't connect with black and white movies in the same way as I do now like now I can watch those films and kind of see where it is terrifying or what they're trying to do and well there's a lot um, of interesting art design in yeah. those films as yeah. well I love it but yeah like growing up I think I enjoyed it but I didn't know why I enjoyed it and then it kind of took a modern horror film for me to be like oh horror is not only something I really enjoy but has a lot of depth to it and can be so many things Yes. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a conversation that people have online a lot. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's, if it's not scary, it's not a horror movie. Mm-hmm. But because different things scare different types of people, that's not the only barometer. Right. Exactly. It's so much. I mean, from decade to decade, it shifts, mm-hmm. not only stylistically, but in what subgenre is dominating. And, you know, when you start really getting into horror and getting into like deep cuts, you uncover subgenres you didn't even know existed. Yes. Which is yeah. so cool. And that's what's interesting, too, about the way, you know, I hear a lot from people who this is a holiday and history and storytelling focused podcast. So, of course, we do talk about horror films sometimes and people share what they're watching, but mm-hmm. we're not a movie podcast. We yeah. do movie stuff on Patreon, but we really do. I like to get a little more into like the history and the actual traditions and celebrations of Halloween. That being said, I think it's really hard to separate horror from Halloween because of the way costume design for movies has influenced our costume choices as trick or treaters or going to a Halloween party or a costume contest. Yeah, absolutely. They're very much interlinked. 
And I'm really interested in something you told me recently about how costume designers don't really have control over their IP, which is their intellectual property, their mm-hmm. design often gets turned into marketable Halloween costumes for purchase. Mm-hmm. And then they don't get any either just basic credit or financial credit. Right. How yeah. does that work? That seems wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it does. And I, you know, I think that costume design is in general something that people are only recently sort of starting to have conversations about in general in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Um, because it really does, not only does it take up 70% of the screen, you know, these costumes, it really informs who these characters are. Yeah. Um, and it informs the stories to such a um, large degree um, that um, it really it has been overlooked for many, many years. Um, well, especially and, in a horror movie, because yeah. costumes are part of what adds to the scariness. Exactly. Like, what if somebody's, if you see a tall man across the room, mm-hmm. how do you know if he's alive or dead? Like, mm-hmm. what do his clothes say? Are the clothes clean and pressed? Are they rumpled? Is there dirt on them? Are they torn? Is mm-hmm. there, like, gashes underneath them? Are they blood-soaked? Like, Right. And so much of that, obviously, there's what's written in the script, mm-hmm. but isn't so much of that seems like that also comes from the costume designer, the art direction. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much tonally that comes to a character and a story you're trying to tell. And, you know, you the the goal and kind of how to approach it is how can I juxtapose this character with the other characters in the way that the, you know, the the film's tone is supposed to come across. And that's why you'll see, um, you know, characters like, you know, Freddie and Jason look so starkly different to um, their counterparts, their victims. Right. Um, you know, you see like the teen victims in, you know, like the 80s golden age looking very um, bright with like primary color palettes and pastels and light colors. And then their counterparts and these villains are going to be much more, um, they're heavier. Even the textures and the fabrics are heavier. Like well, that's the construction. A good point. Um, yeah, like and the, the color palettes. Yeah, like jumpsuit, uh, heavy sweater, uh, like whatever it is that Jason's always wearing, like a trench yeah, like coat. Industrial, or something. yeah, an industrial, kind of, thing. yeah, versus the lighter like cottons and whatnot. But um, yeah, I mean, it's when it comes to um, intellectual property. I mean, it's hard already for um, uh, say a. Uh, uh, film production company wants to have the rights to um a costume let alone the costume designer trying to fight that battle it's just a really hard kind of muddied water because you know it's it's part fashion part artwork um part character and part branding when you look at what a costume is and when Mm. you boil it down and approaching that and having rights over it um is really really difficult Um, but the conversation is, I think, especially prevalent when it comes to, um, horror designers specifically that have created, um, these iconic looks. So for me, that what comes to mind is, you know, either like universal picture crowd or like the eighties golden age, probably even more significantly because that's, was a really heightened time for, um, Halloween costumes. I think that was a massive shift was happening like the 60s to the 80s. Yeah, definitely. Well, being a kid in the 90s, I just remember every year you saw kids in Jason masks yeah. and kids in Freddy Krueger. I don't remember as many Michaels in the 90s, and that's because a lot of those, the like major sequels would kind of wrapping up by that time, and they didn't. Mm-hmm. he didn't start coming back again until the late 90s, but every little boy had a Jason mask on Yeah, when I was a kid. Yeah, and I mean, and it becomes this almost external thing from the movie. Um, and when it's so mass-produced and commercialized, I, I think that there are plenty of costumes, and many of them are from horror films, that you might not necessarily know the original IP, or you, you don't have to be a horror fan, basically, mm-hmm. to dress up like Jason Voorhees for Halloween. You just have to be like a child <laughs> and right. that wants it and wants to dress up like that because they see it in a store. Absolutely. And I think I've heard stories from Lanterns who haven't seen or who had yeah. said they had never seen the movies, but they liked the costume. Mm-hmm. Because you're when you're walking down the grocery store aisle or the costume store aisle and you just see a cool mask or a cool weapon, mm-hmm. sometimes that draws the eye. 
a little more, but it's interesting to think about how many levels removed it is from its original kind of intention. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I also kind of think about how many people might not even, I mean, you see a, a, say a ghost face mask and you recognize it as ghost face, but I think that, um, one, a lot of people might not associate it with scream, right? but, um, just think of it as a iconic Halloween mask or you see, um, like an example that I like to think of <laughs> is, uh, you see like a knockoff Beetlejuice costume, but it's called like juice demon. <laughs> <laughs> juice and demon is such a good word. And like you, you're looking at that and you're like, I know that's a Beetlejuice costume. Right. But they couldn't get the rights to right. it. Yeah. They couldn't get a license. So they have to call it juice demon. <laughs> so it's, you know, tricky for the companies that are mass producing it, but, um, and you it's got to be hard for the artist who's the like... The artist behind it, yeah. I came up with a black and white suit, and now black and white suits are even... What's interesting about Beetlejuice is his black and white wedding suit a mm-hmm. few years ago kind of had this resurgence in the form of... I, I think maybe even black milk leggings started it, but making those... Mm-hmm. black and white striped leggings and there was a time there about 10 years ago where they were just like every cool girl had. oh they were hot yeah they were very <laughs> they were hot moment. yes which is like 20 more you know yeah more than 20 years later after that mm-hmm. movie comes out and like again but I guess that happens with fashion right like it's like music it's like movies mm-hmm. you take what's been done you put your own little spin on it yeah, yeah. And it's funny, though, when it comes to film as well, because when you think of like, say, you know, right now, for example, a lot of early 2000s trends are coming back. Um, but when we think about the trend cycle, what comes to mind will be like, you can, when you think of the mini skirt, you can kind of put a designer to it. You think of like the Miu Miu mini skirt. There's mm-hmm. like a there's credit that almost comes with a lot of massive trends. But when it comes to trends in um, costume design or how, um, costume design either influence Halloween costumes or real fashion trends, which happens, Mm -hmm. um, because our media really influences everything. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You, you're not going to get a lot of direct credit unless there's, you know, at least on the mainstream level, I think that people that are fashion historians are right about, you know, fashion or costume or film might be able to, I don't know, watch a Gucci show and say that they saw something that felt inspired by the Stepford Wives or something like it was Stepford Wives esque or, you know, something right, like that. Right. Um, but generally you're just not going to get a lot of credit. And I think the problem with Halloween costumes is um, not only do costume designers not get a lot of credit, you know, for their work to begin with, just because um, in the 80s and prior, a lot of costume designers were only credited as costume supervisor or a wardrobe assistant, even though they were the costume designers and were the only people on these productions doing wardrobe because it was cheaper oh, for them to be. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So a smaller credit means they can pay that person less. Yeah. And then how does a title like that affect how they're treated going forward in their profession? Well, it definitely affects them because they can they can tell people that they were the costume designer and I think that, you know, professionally they can they they know that that's their work and everyone can see like, oh, well if they're that's the only person on the wardrobe team, then surely it has to be their work. Right. Um, but honestly, like people just weren't even considering crediting costume design in general. Like it just wasn't something that came up in conversation. And it's just really crazy, especially when you think about it, you know, the eighties and prior being such a particularly rough, I mean, it still is pretty rough, but particularly rough time for designers to get credit or get paid accordingly, or at least get the title that they deserve. Um, those were the times when a lot of iconic Halloween costumes were kind of formed that, you know, we can look back on that have now kind of built a legacy. And so you have these costumes becoming some of the most iconic looks Mm -hmm. ever, just in media in general. Um, But then also not having someone that on paper is the costume designer, except in retrospect or to people who have 
you know, looked into it. But generally, most people wouldn't know who created these looks. So do you think then what happens is the directors or the producers will end up getting credit? Because it seems like in general, people don't realize that all directors interact with costumes differently. Some people have a vision. I mean, just speaking for myself, there was a idea I wanted to have for surprise because I was really influenced by Jawbreaker and I wanted to take what made Jawbreaker very iconically 90s and I wanted to do that for where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. So I gave you some ideas, but then you really, you took it further than I could have imagined. Too far. (laughs) Yeah, it's too much. (laughs) I didn't know how to tell you except for publicly on a podcast (laughs) that I don't like it. (laughs) Um, And so it's the kind of thing where I would, I want people to know that you did this because I... Thank you. Of course, because I couldn't... You took what was in my brain and then you made it even better and my brain is pretty great. So I mean, yeah, it was really hard to make that better. <laughs> Thank um, you. but I did. No. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting because some directors are really hands off. For sure. And so you have costume designers and art directors that put together the entire look of the film and then the director gets the credit for everything. Yeah. And that I mean that is something that costume designers and a lot of other people in creative departments on film depending on, you know, the style and tone of the film um that can be really difficult. Um, I think, I mean, it was great working with you. I love being able to collaborate with a director that has a really clear vision of what they want and we can kind of, you know, bounce off of each other in a really fun way. But honestly, like back in the day, I think it was even less common for a director to really care all too much about costume design. Mm. Um, I mean, I I think it might've been the, um, first Halloween there's like something weird in the first few Halloween films where there's like either not a costume department credited or they're like just credited as an assistant and I'm pretty sure um they just had um Jamie Lee Curtis like go shopping with that person right and just kind of like picked up some random stuff and so I mean there are films where it's just less of something, especially if it's when it comes to something that's more like realism or doesn't have a super like highly stylized vision. Mm-hmm. You'll find that um, a lot of designers are just like do whatever. Right. Um, or I'm sorry, a lot of directors are telling the designers to kind of do whatever. Right. Well, like on my first film, I didn't have an art director at all because I just I wanted Ellie and Dennis to look like a real couple. And so I was just like, wear what you would wear at mm-hmm. home with your boyfriend or girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And so there just wasn't a lot of, I was focusing more on the acting and like the lighting and there's a lot of slapstick and messed up. So Mm -hmm. I was like very focused on the slapstick design. (laughs) Um, So I can see like you're saying a little bit, not that that film is realism at all, but when you, sometimes there are like the super indie gonzo sets where they're just like, you're wearing what you're wearing. Right. For sure. And I think that that can really work for a lot of films, but um, you know, it it can be hard when it's like, um, I think that, like, when it comes to iconic looks. Right. You know. We were talking about, like, um, Emma Stone as Cruella. Like, that kind of kicked off a huge debate because of how popular some of those looks were. And it was really big for Halloween. Did that come out last year? Mm -hmm. 2021. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, another example of that that we talked about the other day is Harley Quinn. Yes. Yeah, people who maybe were never into the comics before... Mm -hmm. The Harley Quinn uh, in the newest Birds of Prey movie Mm -hmm. is just like so incredible, has such like a the jacket that is made up of caution tape and all kinds of different trash. It's just like (laughs) the best jacket I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that really played on people's imaginations Mm -hmm. and that people were like, yes, that's me for Halloween. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's it can be it's very common that directors are going to get credit for a costume designer's work um, because, you know, whether or not that director was involved or hands-on in whatever department, it's usually unknown to the public. The public's coming for the movie. They don't know the semantics or how it was set up behind the scenes, but just the way it's been um, set up in Hollywood, it's it's still relatively rare for really any department besides the directors, um, usually the producers, sometimes the writers, sometimes the DPs will get credit for really anything else when it comes to special effects, when it comes to 
um, like you sound know, design. Sound design. So much of sound is the way that it's mixed yeah. and the way that it, you know, surrounds sound, like how it envelops you when you're in the theater. Yeah, exactly. There's so many elements, you know, and, and I think that it's because it really does take a village to make a film. I think that, you know, not everyone is interested in the behind the scenes of film. And so I do understand that. But I think it's when it comes to costumes that are then sort of commercially promoted or mass produced and kind of become its own entity, it's you don't associate that costume with the person who created that costume you associate it with the general ip which you then associate with the director yeah and that can kind of suck for designers who um they've made like an indelible mark on our culture yes and don't get royalties from it and they already got paid probably less for an inaccurate credit um many times and um that doesn't happen as much these days um, but I mean, it can, it can. Sure. Yeah. Depending, um, especially depending on the level of the budget. Right. And how much was, you know, sometimes there's a lot of stuff going on with royalties now in streaming services. Mm -hmm. People don't get as many royalties as they used to when it was just box office and like home video sales. Right. And so, I mean, it really is just sort of, um, it's a chronic issue, I think, especially with, um, within the costume community of, of just not getting paid enough, not getting, um, proper credit. Um, and then when it comes to Halloween costumes specifically, they it's kind of just like a, a losing battle as far as getting credit because you didn't get credit on the film right. or even doing the work <laughs> on the film. And then you further definitely don't have any rights over um, something that you created. Even yeah. if it was for a production, you're still not getting credit for making it for the production. Right. And you're and the large part of creating what is so meaningful and exciting to people's imagination. Right. Well, with that in mind, are there some horror costume designers that we should know? Like we were saying, they're not really big pop culture names yet, but they do influence so much of our lives. And I'm wondering if maybe you could inform the lanterns of some people you really admire or uh, some names you think should become more household names. Yeah, for sure. Um, there are a couple designers that I think really deserve more credit and traction for the work that they have done that has really created cultural phenomenons of costumes that we kind of view as iconic um, day to day and for the Halloween season. Um, Cynthia Bergstrom, she was the costume designer for the first Scream. And oh, cool. Did she discover the peanut-eyed ghost mask? The peanut-eyed ghost mask was actually discovered by the producer, oh, that's right. um, Marion Madalena. Um, I actually knew that because I did an episode on it <laughs> in January, and I totally forgot. So you could go back and listen to our Small Frights <laughs> Peanut-Eyed Ghost episode. <laughs> yes, which is a very interesting story. Yeah, because it was just in Stu's house, the character yeah. Stu, when they were doing location scouting. That's mm -hmm. a real house. Mm -hmm. And so they saw it in the garage. And they yeah, they like, saw it, and they are like, this is the one. Yeah. And then they went through, um, you know, long story short, they ended up coming to an agreement with Fun World, the manufacturer of the original mask and the mask is now called the ghost face mask but they're kind of an anomaly that doesn't happen right um with masks usually because it's like pre-existing ip like mm -hmm. michael myers mask is pre-existing star trek slash william shatner's face <laughs> ip and so you know calling that a michael myers mask is is it's layered it's, it's very layered. funny <laughs> um but uh yeah so i mean she did amazing work on scream and i think really informed the uh, look of the film and I think is a great example um, outside of just Ghostface um, of sort of showing characters identity through their costume which is something I'm really passionate about and something I find really interesting. Tatum, um, Sydney's best friend, mm -hmm. I mean her costumes are so fun and you see her big personality through yeah. everything that she wears. Yeah, absolutely. And she's a great example of sort of um, a grassroots costume that has come about um, through horror lovers. And even people that aren't super into horror, I'm starting to see more people referencing Tatum's outfits just because they're so fun and so unique. Um, I love that. Which is really fun to see. And so Cynthia's great. Um, you know, she is the first person who designed sort of the cloak for Ghostface. Cool. Um, and something interesting really about all of those sort of... Um, 
really any franchise um, that comes to mind that has a lot of commercial traction, um, each film, there were little shifts that would happen, like the um, the tattered bottom of um, Ghostface's cloak um, was shifted throughout with each designer throughout each film. Shifted in what way? Like some were cut with the square cut. Some were cut with kind of a more sharp, triangular tatter. Oh. It's just tiny little details that... Um, like they leave their mark on that yeah, film. Yeah, which I really love. And so Cynthia was, of course, the first person to do this. And um, I think she'd get more credit, um, as well as the producer, um, Marion, that, you know, kind of combined together, created this ghost face look that's pretty iconic. Um, another great example um, is Dana Lyman, who... Um, was the first costume designer for the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. Oh, cool. Um, so she came up with Freddy's look? Came up with Freddy's whole look. Um, and I will say that while Wes Craven is a great example of a director that gets a lot of credit for work other people put in, he also d- is pretty hands-on. Like, he yeah. does have a lot of input and a lot of collaboration. So I think he gets a little bit of a pass. Yeah, he also <laughs> seems to do a good job of talking up the people Absolutely. that he works with. And then he seems to have really seen, obviously, sadly, he has passed, but he was a very collaborative artist mm-hmm. and really came up from the bottom. Yeah, I mean, even about uh, the ghost face mask, I'm pretty sure that he initially said he found it. Then when he realized he misremembered, he told everyone it was his producer. Oh, good. Probably because oh, he felt bad. <laughs> I love that. He's from Ohio, so he's yeah. got so a good you know, heart. He's, yeah, he's got a good <laughs> heart. Um, and, uh, yeah, so with um, the Nightmare franchise, um, Dana Lyman created that look, um, and they did draw a lot of inspiration from Wes Craven's real life and, like, scary experiences that Wes Craven had in his real life. Um, oh, that's cool. And then also a shout-out to David B. Miller for... Um, Freddy's prosthetics. I think that's a look that people also, of course, want to try. And, you know, he doesn't have a mask, so it's not as, um, you know, mask and then the costume around it. But I do love seeing people kind of doing, like, face paint or doing their own prosthetics at home with that creepy, gross face stuff. Um, But he was the first person to establish that sort of creepy inside look. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, I love that. Which, you know, of course adds to the costume. And I think when you think about, um, yeah, you can't really be, you can put on like the striped sweater and mm -hmm. the, the hat and and the glove, but who is Freddie if not a pedophile burned in an incinerator? Right. <laughs> you know? Who is he? Just a little man in a fedora? Yeah. No, he's <laughs> got to be same. He's got to be burned up. Otherwise, he's not filled with vicious anger. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then uh, the other person I wanted to mention um, is Sandy Love, who she was a costume designer for um, the third Friday the 13th film, which um, which a lot of people don't actually know that aren't super into horror where um, the third film is really the first time we see Jason in the costume that people now recognize as the Jason Voorhees costume. So the hockey mask. Yeah, that's where the hockey mask comes into play. The one before that was the burlap sack Which over the head. Which is a really creepy, cool look, but we yeah. never see the sack again. Yeah, I know. Luce and I do believe that someone should probably pick up doing that Jason yeah. Voorhees costume because it's sack such a cool Jason's one. Jason's got to come back. Yeah. We the gotta... sack is back. <laughs> <laughs> so They're ready to hack. <laughs> Sorry, I'll gotta bring, We got to bring back sack Jason. <laughs> um, and then before the first one, he was like, not was, even in yeah. it early. So anyways, uh, Sandy Love did the third film, and she is an example of someone that was only credited as costume supervisor, um, which is just simply incorrect. Yeah, it makes it sound like you're standing in a room full of clothes racks, and you're making right. sure nobody's losing anything. Right, and that is... Part of it. Part of it. I mean, that's <laughs> part of it, but, you know, usually a wardrobe team is consisted of costume designer, costume supervisor, um, s- set costumer... Um, and like an, an wardrobe assistant, mm-hmm. that's like the foundational roles. I mean, and it can expand in any which way you can have agers and dyers who are the people that are usually in charge of, and this is very important in horror films, making clothes look tattered or making them look older than they are. Um, a very common, uh, costume designer pet peeve is when something looks too new. Like oh, you just yeah. bought like white shoes when they've 
should have owned them for, you know, two years, you're like, the character would not have... These brand new white brand shoes. Brand new white shoes from Target. Well, you got to work as an ager on the movie Pig with Nicolas Cage, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. It was really... Re- I learned so much on that film about that process. And that, like, core sort of, like, four roles was how that um, that department was structured. Um, Jamie Hansen um, was the amazing costume designer. And she did a lot of her own aging and dying work. And I just, like, learned from her on how like she did that and then um, my friend Jordan Hamilton was the costume supervisor and they're kind of an iconic duo they did Portlandia together as well oh cool Um, I love them both but um, yeah I mean the roles are very different costume designers take the lead creatively and costume supervisors are usually their second in command um, helping them manage everything especially on a big film when you have a lot to manage and in horror films you're probably going to have a lot of duplicates of the same item because when it comes to blood spatter and stuff, you have to think about continuity. If your shooting schedule is not continuous or if you just want to have a backup in case you mess up the scene. That's such a great point. You have to have like duplicates of the things that, you know, you have. And so um, that's why agers and dyers are important, but also why um, you have a, a department that has multiple roles. But when, I mean, one, even when it's just one costume designer and they don't hire them a team. Right. Even if they're getting compensation and they are um getting the credit for what they're doing they are truly having to work overtime having to manage that all on your own is so hard um like i always have to have someone helping me i usually have like on smaller films having like um like on baby fever i had um, a costume supervisor um was my friend malia and uh they helped me with everything um, and, um, then we had assistants come on for set, you know, just managing it on set. It's like a whole different ballpark. So no, it's true. Cause I know for surprise, we only had one costume for everybody, but there is right. blood and mm-hmm. I really just didn't think about it. And so we had to just be like to the actress who was dealing with the blood, don't get in the blood. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, and that's, and it can be, it can be fun on like an indie level of like, you know, just kind of running into those things. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it. the crossroads with special effects is a big collaboration point for wardrobe um, on horror films. But yeah, I mean, it's it's already a lot to manage. So when you are Sandy Love and you're designing the third Friday the 13th film, you already... And it's like, I believe she did have an assistant, but um, it's a pretty large film. A lot of people running around, costumes to manage, um, probably duplicates to manage, Um and you also aren't getting credited as a designer. I mean, and then your costume turns out to be one of the most iconic costumes ever and you have no rights to it. Yeah, that's like really disappointing. It's yeah, I can only imagine that it's difficult. Um, I'm sure she's very proud of herself. She should be. Um, and I do hope that you. she gets. Yeah, we love you. Uh, Miss Sandy, I, I hope that um, you feel fairly con compensated because we yeah. want you to feel fairly compensated because you should be well so for anybody dressing up as jason this mm-hmm. halloween season and then somebody asks you you can be like oh this is what what's her name again sandy love this is sandy love designs exactly <laughs> you pay your respects to miss sandy love um and then also uh with that look specifically the mask um the hockey mask uh was molded from a uh, hockey fan and 3D effects supervisor, Martin J. Sadoff. He was the one who um, discovered the mask. I'm pretty sure he just had the mask and he molded it and then was like, hey, do you guys, is this cool? <laughs> <laughs> That's me making everything yeah. I make. Is this, uh, is this, this cool? Is this cool? <laughs> is this what we like? And they're like, yeah, it's this, this is the one. And then they just went for it. I mean, obviously it. it was so meaningful because then they never really lost that essential look. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even like um, there's a, a a copycat killer in the franchise somewhere. Maybe, you know, don't want to give away too many spoilers. No spoilers for this 40 um, year old series. <laughs> for this 40 year old series that everyone knows about. Um, but uh, they use the hockey mask, but they use different markings on it. And so you don't know it's a copycat killer. Um, But if you pay extra close attention, you might notice that the mask is different, but only subtly, which I love. I love little subtle details like that. And that's a costume designer getting in there and Mm -hmm. leaving their mark. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that they 
are very much designers, um, you know, in a pool of many that that do deserve um, more credit, especially when it comes to um, Halloween costumes. Um, and then one designer that if you want to get into costume design and specifically horror costume design that I just wanted to shout out um, Please. and maybe should be um, a reference point if you're trying to think of a fun DIY costume to do this year um, Eiko Ishioka, who designed Bram Stoker's Dracula. Oh, Some of the most gorgeous. opulent, so opulent freaking costumes of all time. I love the white vampire costume. It's insane. It's and gorgeous. I think it's, if you, you know, do like a binge on white lace and tulle from Joanne's, you could probably make it work. Absolutely. Um, I mean, that much white lace is going to be terrifying. Yeah. No matter how you pull it off. Exactly. And then she also did the costumes for Jennifer Lopez's The Cell. Yes. She did The Cell. Which is a very scary movie. So scary. And I think that in both of those films... Um, and the other films that she designed, you can really see that the costume design has such a huge impact mm-hmm. on the film. It's it very intentional. It creates the entire and, yes, world. Exactly. They're actually, without the costumes, the, it's not that the stories aren't good or the performances aren't good, but they're all little pieces of the pie. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think the costumers or the costume design and production design of those two movies specifically are like half the pie. Yeah. For sure. I mean, and it's just, she's, she comes from a background of graphic design and took a Hmm. lot of like tech influences with her throughout her, her work. Um, And she did win um, an Oscar for costume design for Bram Stoker's Dracula. So I'm very, very happy about that. And I believe she did a, she won a costume designers guild award as well at some point in her career. But um, so so that's a good example of somebody who is getting recognition. She has passed. Yes, she has passed, um, but a great, starting point if you want to kind of dig into the history of costume design that's terrific thank you for that knowledge of course okay i want to dive deep into halloween costuming with you so you know there's two different kinds of halloween costumes Mm -hmm. there's something somebody totally comes up with on their own totally fresh idea and then there is something that comes from pop culture Mm -hmm. whether that's a book tv show movie music Something that you can say, oh, I'm Frankenstein. And people are like, I get it. (laughs) Um, So what is it about those pop culture costumes? Because, you know, there's trends like every year. You're like the year that Birds of Prey came out. There are a ton of Harley Quinns. Mm -hmm. The year that Black Swan came out. There are a ton of uh, the ballerina costumes. So what is it that makes a pop culture character or a moment even so memorable that it elevates it to Halloween costume status? That's a great question. And I think that, I mean, culture shifts so much and you can really see kind of that reflected in Halloween costumes and what's kind of going on. And even just the history of Halloween and how costumes have shifted, you know, it kind of started as like genuinely trying to terrify off spirits and like truly terrifying yeah, like, like home creation. I am a spirit. Don't mess with me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And so that was, you know, that's what they were expressing at that time. Just true fear. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. When you look at costumes, if you like look, go to Pinterest and look at Victorian Halloween costumes, there's some of the scariest paper mache creations that you could ever find. Mm-hmm. And kind of when we get into the like the 20s and the 30s, um, that's sort of when you start to see, um, you know, the U.S. has kind of taken on Halloween and there's sort of a marketable shift to it. It's like mm-hmm. at the kind of beginning of being commercialized a little bit. Yeah, it's true. Like in the 20s, uh, after King Tut's tomb was discovered, it created this huge Egyptian craze where people threw mm-hmm. Egyptian-themed parties. And for Halloween parties, people would dress up a lot as, a, you know, what they thought of as Egyptians. Right. I mean, and that's another thing to mention that historically Halloween costumes have either been sexist or culturally insensitive throughout time. And I <laughs> think we're, we're trying very hard to move away from that now. And I think that we have, for the most part, done a good job culturally to, to create a better narrative. Yeah, um, definitely. And that there are so many things to choose from that's not culturally stereotyping mm-hmm. a large swath of people. <laughs> There's so many options. Yeah. We just need to you get creative. Use a little imagination. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
But, you know, so in sort of the, the 20s and 30s, um, I mean, masks have remained popular. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that sort of mid-century, um, last century was certainly, it was more prevalent. But at the same time, there was starting to be sort of more of a shift to um, showing their face and doing more full body costumes. Yeah. And like really elaborate makeup. I feel yeah. like the last 20 years has, there has been like a big focus on. Mm-hmm doing wild makeup instead of wearing a plastic mask. Right, exactly. And that, so that's something that too has been sort of a, a method of expression and um, kind of back then too, we started to see a shift to um, IP that wasn't just scary. It wasn't, or, you know, from folklore, or just from a scary movie. Um, it was also from like, it was like Popeye or, you know. Right, like or like Betty Boop. I feel like I saw a lot of like um, Kill Bill Mm-hmm. Uh, the bride. Yeah. You know, the yellow costume. Yeah, exactly. And I wonder too if it's like, obviously, I think there's an element of like, how easy is this for me to create? Mm-hmm. And it seems to be a split of people who want to be recognized, where it's like, okay, you'll know that I am Beatrix Kiddo mm-hmm. if I wear a yellow jumpsuit with a black stripe down the side. And that's mm-hmm. pretty easy to put together, even if I don't have like a sword with me. Right. But then you and I were talking about this earlier, too, about how we're sort of on the side of like, we want to make you guess a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) A cool costume. What could it be? Yeah, yeah. Like I'm going to be, but then I'm also going to be grumpy if nobody gets it. (laughs) Yeah. And then I'm going to be annoyed, but I'm going to be looking very cool and fun. So I'm I'm curious about like the kind of psychology really that goes into that as well. So like, yeah, there's definitely like the cultural shifts of what is popular. Mm -hmm. In that moment, and then, like, what is easy to recreate. Right. And I think that so much of um, Halloween costumes is it's really just an extension of what how we show up to the world day to day. Um, I truly feel like what we wear in our day to day lives is our own personal costumes. Like, we are the costume designers of our own lives. Yeah, definitely. And um, we're just choosing a Halloween costume that we would wear for our personal costume. You know what I mean? Right. Like what do you want people to see your costume and think about you? Yeah. I think there's so much that goes into it and whether it's, um, you know, you want to, um, showcase certain interests, you know, I think that's kind of where we land on, on the spectrum of like, we love costume and we love characters and the camp of it all. And we want to showcase that. Mm-hmm. love and like showcase an interest in a way and a great execution of course, <laughs> of always course. a good execution you're um, much better at the execution than i am <laughs> i'm always like the the discount version of that thing i'm like the, <laughs> the, the the character that's on hollywood boulevard in the unlicensed version of the costume I'm like you're, i you're did juice my demon. best yeah i'm juice demon <laughs> i come up with my own juice demon looks i don't yeah. need to go to spirit to buy them yeah so it's you know, juice demon with a little extra flavor, but um, yeah, I mean it, it is really interesting about how how do you want to show up to the world. Um, there was a study done in I think it was the early '90s. It was called like costume and the perception of identity and role, and it was basically like selected men and women from this college and whether or not they were more or less um, likely to conceal their identity. On Halloween, which I thought was interesting. And of course, at this time, masks were even more prevalent than they are now, I think. Yeah. Um, with Halloween costumes. Basically, what they found was that men were significantly more likely to choose a costume that was concealing their identity. Hmm. Um, and that just kind of made me think about um, not only the psychology of like showcasing your personality or what you want to show up to the world as what you want people to think about you, whether you're fun or knowledgeable or whether you want to hide in the background a little bit. There's also an element of how you were socialized. Sure. Um, that, uh, can inform sort of what you view as your options. Hmm. Um, and what you are just more predispositioned to wear, whether that's sort of, um, uh, cultural pressure and you feel like you can't explore other costumes Mm -hmm. um or whether it's you know it is more in line just with what you you identified with 
That's um, interesting. You kind of see that in the movie Mean Girls, where mm-hmm. the jokes, so many of the jokes in Mean Girls come from Caddy, Caddy <laughs> Heron being a uh, fish out of water. Mm-hmm. And not being raised in uh, with American culture. So when she goes to the Halloween party of the popular kids, she doesn't realize that the most popular thing to do is to dress very sexy. And mm-hmm. she dresses in a scary costume and it freaks everybody else out at the party. Right. Which I love. That's one of my favorite scenes. You know, I, I like to collect like Halloween scenes in non-Halloween movies because mm-hmm. it's fun to be watching a movie and there's some surprise Halloween in it. Oh, yeah. It's it's the best. And then you love the movie even more. Exactly. <laughs> and it's such a great scene because Kate, Kate I really want to keep calling her Caddy. Caddy Heron. <laughs> because Katie really shows up as herself in that moment. That's She, wants, she was like, I'm going to be something so scary. And mm-hmm. she comes up with a totally original costume, ex-wife. There's a great, there's wordplay on there. So, you know, thinking this is sort of double layered because it's a costume designer for a film. Mm-hmm trying to come up with what a Halloween costume of this character, what does it say about her? Mm -hmm. And what does it say about her story, too? Yeah. Like, I think it can really mirror a lot there with being the fish out of water and being scared. And she shows up in a scary Halloween costume and everyone else is showing up as what society perceives as the most sexy, idealized thing that young girls feel that they are supposed to be. Right, exactly. And like you think about Karen and Gretchen and it's like, do they want to dress uh, as a sexy cat and a sexy mouse? Or is it just like, of course they They would. feel like they have to. Yeah, exactly. Either to stay relevant because they feel that that's what they need to do for value mm-hmm. um, or because they are, you know, kind of just following suit. And like, this is what my role as like a hot teen girl as a hot teen girl is and, and just kind of playing the role and and. um yeah, I think that that is really interesting. You can see it in media. Um, I think you see it with, like, group costumes, too. For sure. Is there's always, um, you see sometimes these large group costumes, and you're like, who coordinated that? Like, who's brainchild? <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting, you'll see it in a family where it's like, how can, like, new babies and stuff involved? And it's like, we're all going to be one thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but oftentimes it is someone's idea to be the ringleader oh, yeah, of the costumes. Sure. We had a lantern right in who wanted to be uh, Ariel from The Little Mermaid, and a close family member of hers made all their costumes from hand. So Whoa. it was cool because it was like a licensed character design, but yeah. it had this like original like handiwork to it. So it looks off, and it has that imprint of mm-hmm. reality. Yeah, I mean, to it. and she and wanted, less waste. And less waste. Yeah, exactly. And she wanted her cousin and I think her little brother to be like Flounder and Sebastian. But one of them was like, no. So there's (laughs) like, I think it was her and Flounder. And then her cousin maybe was in a dinosaur or like a flower, like something totally different. Mm -hmm. And then it's like sort of a group costume and dinosaur. That's and so funny. <laughs> that's something I really it's love. Cute. It's cute. And it's something I, I really like about Halloween when you look at pictures and you're like, in what other universe are we going to have like Freddy and a ghost and Ariel and a princess? Mm-hmm. And it's like this mix of uh, characters that we just think of that don't belong to any IP, characters that are pop culture related, and then just like uh, uh, some kind of a monster that you come up with on your own. Yeah, like we are the multiverse. <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting to think about how you can look at that, a picture of all of those and mm-hmm. kind of, not that, you know, you need to armchair psychology it and turn it into a whole thing, but it is interesting to be like, oh, that's a kid who wanted to do something totally different. Yeah. And like, that's a kid who wanted everybody to know how much he loves Nightmare on Elm Street. For sure. I mean, costumes can be such an expansive way to uh, view identity and to explore identity. Um, I think that's why a lot of queer people love costumes and love kind of going over the top with it and and really exploring things that aren't just what you'll find on a spirit Halloween, although I do love spirit Halloween. Of course. Um, (laughs) Respectfully. (laughs) Respectfully. Um, (laughs) But uh, yeah, it can be really expansive, but also there is kind of something to be said about, um, especially right now, maybe not even specifically right now. I think the only difference really is just that we have social media kind of uh, perpetuating this, but um, aesthetics and perfection and wanting to do something perfect. If you have a group of friends and you want to be, you know, mystery ink, 
but one friend wants to be, you know, juice demon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then that friend's out of the circle. Yeah, there's like some sort of, you know, it's it's not Instagrammable. Or, you know, back in the day, maybe it, it, it probably much harder. It would not be very in line with the atomic family if you were to do something that was um, out of what was commercially promoted at the time. Right. That's interesting that you bring this up. I think about this a lot because I, in college, um, my boyfriend Warren, who you know, because mm-hmm. he also uh, DPs on our films, uh, he and I were Jack and Wendy Torrance from The Shining. But it was before social media. It was before Instagram. So Mm -hmm. social media was like a lot more chill. It was like Facebook and MySpace were still kind of hanging out before Twitter. And we just went to Goodwill to find costumes that were close enough. Like we watched the movie. We were like, okay, this is kind of what they look like. And then Warren found a plaid shirt. And I couldn't Mm -hmm. find like that jumper. So I also just got a plaid shirt. I think we both wrote like red rum on our shirts, which is not what happens in the movie. Like those, that's Mm -hmm. not how Jack and Wendy look, but we were like, that's what we could find in our like rural college town. We were like, great. We know what we are. Everybody who came in knew what we are, but you look at them now and I think it'd be a lot harder to get away with a costume like that because there is sort of a focus on perfectionism. If you're going to be a character Totally. You have to have all these elements of the character, which means you can spend so much money ordering clothes online or, you know, you go to Goodwill to put a costume together now. You you can't do that exact pop culture look. Yeah, for sure. I think that there is, we're we're sort of, um, it's becoming much more expensive, I think. Yeah, Um, but this like really bothers me because I think it takes a little creativity away. Totally. I completely agree. Like put your own spin on it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's much less grassroots and more, um, you know, I, I would say it's almost the, the average person is now trying to kind of create, um, you know, and it's totally fine if they want to, but I think there is a societal pressure to do something that's of, like, cosplay level, of, like, like doing something that is, like, and cosplay is an investment. Yeah, you definitely. Know? And it is different from a Halloween costume. Yeah. I'm wondering how these two sort of, because it feels like the cosplay community just started molding with the Halloween, not community necessarily, but the the values, the dedication of cosplay started yeah. like overlapping with how you should be costuming yourself with Halloween. Yeah. Do you think that's the prevalence of like seeing cosplay, people being able to show off their cosplay on like Instagram? I think so. And I think that like, there's either and or, I guess, um, a connection with just sort of visibility with mm. seeing the world of cosplay, but also with just seeing people and having more access to community, which can be really great, but also opens you up to a lot of comparison, which comes very easily in the world we live in. Totally. And Instagram flattens out everybody's lives. So if you're looking for inspiration to be Wednesday Adams Mm -hmm. and you look at the hashtag Wednesday Adams, it's going to bring up thousands of examples. And some of those people are going to have a ton of resources. They're going to live somewhere where they might, the the cost of living might be lower. Um, They may be primarily already shop online. They might be crafters, sewers, Mm -hmm. like, so you're looking at all of these looks and you're like, all these outfits are perfect. Right. I only have $20 to spend on Halloween. I've actually never sewn anything before. I live in a huge city where it's like super hard to find anything good on a budget. I'm I'm sort of talking about my own insecurities at this point. (laughs) (laughs) But I mean, I think that's relatable to a lot of people. Um, And uh, I mean, I also think that Again, this is very much something that affects everyone, but also very specifically women or people who are socialized as women. I think that we are brought up in general to perfect everything. That's an issue that, you know, we've known about, especially with social media. It's only made it harder. And I think that you can see that influence Halloween costumes as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I'm always talking about how Halloween is supposed to be a source of comfort and a source of community joy instead of competition. And I also think it's like a very creative holiday because it's not religiously affiliated. Mm -hmm. There 
all of the traditions are things you can sort of mold to fit your life. And I feel like with costuming, I want to return to come up with like, what do you want to do? Like, what's your idea? Yeah, come up with fun. something. Yeah, absolutely. And to not feel as much of that pressure to be like, oh, this is the hottest thing. I'm trying to think, what do you think is like the hottest costume going to be for 2022? Like, did you see a trend this year that you think people are going to want to recreate more? I mean, there's the new Wednesday Adam show is coming out mm, mm-hmm. on Netflix. So I am curious, although Adam's family have never really gone away in our culture. I think we, I mean, we did get a lot of, um, we had some great horror film releases in theaters this year. Um, Oh, what about Malignant? Yeah, I think that could be a good one. I think there's also, um, we're going to see Nope. Oh, I think we're going to see a fair amount of Nope. That's fun because there's a lot of different aesthetic designs in Nope. From like Kiki Palmer's incredible looks Mm -hmm. to the alien to, of course, Steven Yeun's costume. Mm -hmm. I think his costume honestly might be, that's the most um, stylized costume, I think. So I think that we will see a lot of his costume specifically. The like red kind of rhinestone cowboy look. Yeah. Just so good. Well, I then think about the girl who plays, um, you know, the victim of Gordy. Uh, and we see her with the veil. Mm -hmm. Uh, Oh, that was so scary. Yeah, that was really scary, and I think that would be a really cool costume and something you could do on the cheap, you know, floral dress, kind of do some skeleton sort of makeup on your face and wear Mm -hmm. a hat with a veil. Yeah, You know what I I think is cool about something like Nope is you could also just, like, put, like, make a cardboard horse and, like, be, like, (laughs) sitting, you know what I mean? That would be so cute fake little legs and it's like you're sitting on the horse because there's so much horse riding in the movie Mm -hmm. I don't know I think I would I would just like to see a return to like doing one's best (laughs) yeah and like your best doesn't have to be the best you don't have to be on the level of a costume designer no or a cosplayer yeah absolutely and I honestly do think that we are returning to maybe a slight cultural shift where people are sort of getting exhausted with the perfectionism of being online oh interesting um I'm noticing that I mean with all the talk about indie sleaze coming back which is like mind fuck but um (laughs) but also like I think that Gen Z is returning to a more it's it you could say that it's perfected authenticity Mm. but I do think that there is an effort currently to return to some form of authenticity and I hope that it at least a little more grittiness yeah that there's some grittiness and and creative expression in there it doesn't have to be so streamlined well that's a great point because creative expression is in its essence not neat not linear Mm -mm. never polished because you can't just have you don't just make a film or right. so a dress. There's lots of really awful mistakes yes, in absolutely. the process. And sometimes the mistakes are part of what makes it really good when you're talking about indie film mm-hmm. uh, or anything, you know, that's DIY. And that's what I love about DIY is having the little mark of people's fingerprints on stuff. Yeah. Because I don't want everything I have to be made by a machine. And I don't want to, as a human being, to try to replicate a machine's work. Right. You know, because like, I don't know, at the end of the day, like you are, when you're buying a costume, it's like, you're buying something that was like made by a machine. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, it's perfect because it was like literally just designed to look exactly like a professional million dollar budget costume. Yeah. Literally cut out and mass produced. And I think that, you know, I mean, life is about play and art is about play. And I think that we should, you know, attempt to return to those elements in our adult lives. I agree. Um, and I think that's one of the hardest lives. thing. Yeah, yeah, but that's one of the hardest things about being an adult is there's not a lot of room for play. Right. And it is something I love about Halloween, especially trying to incorporate mm-hmm. the values of Halloween and Halloween aesthetics throughout the year, is it is playful. Absolutely. And I do, you know, I, I think that a good marker for you know, when you're putting together your costume this year is like, if you wore this costume and it was not on social media, there were no pictures of you in it, or maybe you were just alone. Like, would you still like it? Would you still like have fun? 
I love that. I think it's a good philosophy in general, but when it comes to, you know, Halloween and events and such. Right, because at the end of the day, it really just needs to please you. Yeah, like, did you have fun making it? Was it a fun journey? You know, like, that's what it's all about. Do you, are you having fun homaging something that you love, or did you discover something new? Like, those, I feel like, are the true values of, of Halloween and fun, and I, you know, it doesn't have to be, like, I don't know. The Kardashians do Austin Powers. Right. Yeah, no, thank you. Or Heidi Klum is like sexy Hulk. Actually, maybe we'll see some sexy She-Hulks. Oh, interesting. That could be one. Although I haven't heard a lot of people loving it. I haven't either. And it is a commitment to full body paint. Yeah. But I mean, some people are committed. I would love to see it. I love doing like a, like, oh, I took this selfie of my full body paint costume, but it's truly just like my shoulders up. Right. But it looks like I can lie. I would love to hear from Lanterns who committed to full body paint. Um, yes, absolutely. Were well, there any mishaps? Right. Were there any successes? Well, fun Halloween story. My friend Dustin, who is a listener, shout out to Dustin, in, um, I don't know, one of the last couple of years of college, he dressed as Hellboy and he did commit to um, like hands and face and neck all <laughs> red. Oh, that's going to stain. Oh, it stained our white <laughs> apartment walls so the much walls, so no. that when we moved out of that apartment, we lived there for two and a half years. When we moved out, we were finding, you know, we took everything down. And then when you're just looking at the bare bones of an old apartment, oh there was little red handprints around. That's so funny. That's like when your grandma gets too many like glitter wrapping paper for like Christmas or an event and there's just glitter in the house for like a whole year. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you're, you're like open the bits. box and then it's just like puffs into your face. Yeah. And you're like, this is me now. Yeah, which is fine. I I'll mean, I love it. being covered in glitter, but I understand if it's not for everybody. Yeah. Um, so are there any looks, monsters, characters, anything that you've come across that you think would make a good costume but you haven't seen yet? That is a great question. Probably like so many, so like hundreds. Like I, there's so horror is such a wonderfully stylized genre that you have so much to choose from. I mean, even not just limited to horror. I think sci-fi. Actually, a great sci-fi slash horror, um, Liquid Sky from the '80s. Ooh, so good. What a wild film. Such a wild film. It's very like experimental sci-fi, but also kind of like club kid art house style definitely and there's so many fun unique makeup looks i think anyone would enjoy it it's kind of like a trip like it's a very trippy film yeah i think it's like not for younger listeners as much probably but maybe yeah. like 15 16 and up yeah i would say so but it's extremely psychedelic yeah super psychedelic um a lot of fun just such fun looks um i think ooh i think a fun one would be uh, Phantom of the Paradise, which I think was, what, 1974 or Oh, something? yeah. So Isaac's uh, grandmother was a costume designer on Phantom of the Paradise. Are you kidding? Yeah, it's his step-grandmother. Stop. Yeah. That's literally my favorite movie. Oh, well, we got to talk about it after that's recording. That's a whole, yeah, that's Not so only did cool. she do Phantom of the Paradise, which is incredible costumes, but she also did Tron, and she was oh up gosh. for an Academy Award for the costumes from that Tron. That is so cool. Also... Yeah. You can see a link between those two films. Definitely a lot of metal. <laughs> yeah, just metal is the link. Um, but, but I, I mean, that's such a cool... So all the looks are so cool in that film. Yeah. I love that you're coming up with films that are from the 70s. So you're yeah. saying, like, look back. So not necessarily, sure. like, what the most trendy thing of this year will be. You can find inspiration anywhere. And, um, you know, I mean, and, and there is cool things. I think something that we... I think we saw a little bit of, I was going to say Scarlet Witch, like, and then the Scarlet Witch doing the old Scarlet Witch was fun. Mm -hmm. That's like a more mainstream one that I've seen a bit of that I honestly hope to see more of because I thought that was a really fun one. Um, but yeah, I would say look back um, and just kind of see what, see if you can draw inspiration from a really random film. Yeah. And sometimes I see something that somebody else does and I'm like, well, I don't want to be that character. But that's bringing up something aesthetically that I think is really interesting. Yeah, you like the vibe. And I, I love kind of finding, because there are things that I'm like, something about this is very aesthetically pleasing to me, whether it's my you know personal style or whether it's costume related and maybe not this specific 
look is what I want, but there's an element of this that I like. And a great way to find inspiration is kind of like searching those kinds of keywords, you know, a la that. Tumblr era. A la- <laughs> Tumblr is still good if you're just looking for images. Yeah. People are still tumbling. People are still tumbling. And honestly, I feel like we might see some people dressing up like Tumblr girls for like 2014 tum- me, basically. Everyone's going to dress up like me yeah. for my birthday. <laughs> Um, all around the world. Well, that's a really good point because you were just talking about the re- the return of uh, indie sleaze and the interest oh, yeah. of it. So we're gonna get some grungier looks. We're, um, that's so fascinating. Isaac's work just had like a work party that wasn't a co- that wasn't like a Halloween party, mm-hmm. but it was just like a ball party, and it was indie sleaze themed. And yeah. So it's, like, what's funny is that I almost think it wasn't coming back, but everyone is like. They're trying to make it happen, and it's working. Yeah, so I think you're I right that, that we could see that as a costume this year, which would be mm-hmm. interesting. Just influence in general, like maybe some media from that time might influence too, or just like the general like indie sleaze American apparel yeah, outfit. Yeah, that's really fascinating because I don't think we do see a lot of cultural, like we see pop culture, but mm-hmm. not like necessarily like, oh, I'm a, I'm a person from a time period. Yeah. And also maybe this is less of a something I want. It's not something I don't want, but more of a like forecast. I think that we are going to start seeing more and more costumes influenced by memes. Oh, that's a good point. You know, my friend Alexandria wore a meme costume to my Halloween party in 2015, Mm -hmm. and I thought it was so clever. It's so fun. Because I've never seen anybody do that before. Yeah. I think we're going to start seeing more of that, and if not, we should. Because I think that can be... that. I think that's a great example of maybe a modern sort of take on the just finding something fun to do. Interesting. Versus like a perfect Wednesday Adams, you can be the like, I don't know. The guy with the guitar singing in that vine or something. Yeah, you'd be like, hey, remember this vine? And then you just have the vine with you and you show it to everybody. Yeah. (laughs) You're like, that was me. (laughs) (laughs) That was like the most vague reference and like explanation possible you're like, like I actually don't meme. look at memes um <laughs> but if you guys want to do that yeah, I would it never. sounded like someone that's never been on the internet before <laughs> yeah. explaining a meme please tell me someone knows what I'm talking about <laughs> I'm curious to know if any of our lanterns have been memes send in your meme oh my god clothes please <laughs> um okay is there a dream costume idea that like just feels Like, you haven't been able to do it yet. It's either, like, too big, too complicated, too expensive, Mm. or it's just, like, oh, two-part question. First of all, do you list off costume ideas? Do you have, like, a little book of costumes? And then is there one that's just, like, the holy grail for you? I I do have a list. I do have an ongoing list. I do it. I do it. (laughs) Um, There's, oh, my gosh, there's almost too many to to choose from. One that's kind of like a, honestly, I don't think this would be a hard one to do. But I just haven't done it yet. Um, is uh, Jess from Black Christmas? Oh, cute um, with the hands. Yeah, on the little her shirt. hands sweater. Mm-hmm. I think that's just a really. It's honestly just a really cute sweater. <laughs> um. Yeah, I just want that sweater. Do you know um, Poltergeists and Paramours? The um, Emma Lee is a mm-hmm. horror filmmaker and designer, and she has this website, Poltergeists and Paramours, and she makes horror themed clothes. Yes. I and love this it. year, I think she's actually making the Black Christmas sweater. It's which is such a great. She also made, I think, Tatum's skirt from Scream, which I love is a great that, the choice. one that she's killed in. Yeah, incredible because it's such a unique skirt, and so um, I think she's making a lot of like the sleeper hits that I've been like, please be a thing. Yeah, um, that's that cool. I'm loving to see, and so I think that's a fun one. Um, yeah, there's um, oh, you know what I have really wanted to do? Um, there's a French horror film called Baby Blood from the early '90s. It's one of my favorite. Horror films. Oh, I've never heard of that before. Oh my god, it's so good. Um, and uh, there's this there's this special effect where there are she's pregnant and there are like hands coming out of her stomach. It's like it's crazy body horror gore. Um, it still looks kind of campy, so I, I think you could probably watch it if you were still squeamish. But I just thought that was so crazy and iconic. Like incorporating yeah. that. I love that because it's be crazy. scary too. Yeah. I really it's like scary. scary costumes. Yeah. I I wanna do I love like campy fun stylish things but i also want to do something that's like oh that's just disturbing yeah a return <laughs> to convincing the spirits that you're one of them so yes. don't take you back 
to the other side of the veil. Yeah, exactly. Like, I want to be truly just so terrifying that no one wants to talk to me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> a great goal for Halloween. Yeah. Okay, I have one last major question for you, and then we're going to read a few eek mails from Amazing. Lanterns. This one is, this is the most important question. Okay. If you had to pick only one style to dress in for every Halloween going forward, sexy or scary? Obviously such a hard choice. Yeah. <laughs> I'm both of those things all the time. Right. I know I'm asking you to divide your personality. Ugh, it's just so hard being so sexy, but just being too scary. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I would choose scary because I think that there are more options. Because if I was doing sexy and I couldn't do anything scary because it had to just be sexy and can't be scary. Yeah, but I do think that once you make something sexy i don't know i don't know i'm about to say a thing i don't know if i believe <laughs> like if you're going all in on the sexy look yeah. how scary can it be right i guess like, you could do there a really scary makeup and still have like your uh bodily assets on display mm -hmm. but um so you could be like from the neck up, I'm terrifying. From the neck down, ooh la la. Hey, that could sailor. be a good con compromise. But I mean, or maybe it's like I I do th something so scary, but like my cheekbones are just so snatched that like I'm <laughs> accidentally a little sexy still. Right, you're the nun from The Conjuring, but your cheekbones have edges for days. Right, so like, like oops, I'm so hot. I didn't mean to be. Right, but, but it's I hard when you bit. put a habit on me. It really accentuates my cheekbones. Yeah, exactly. Okay, wow. So the the answer is this Inconclusive. is impossible <laughs> for Emma. She's naturally too hot and terrifying. That's what happens when you're born on Halloween. That's true. You have that <laughs> special gift. Okay. Yeah, I'm actually like, exempt from the question because I was born on Halloween and I get to be both all the time. You comprise all the elements of Halloween. When Thank you. scale yes. from scary to sexy, you are the scale. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, are you ready to hop into some letters from our eek mailbag? I'm so excited. E excited. You're e excited. <laughs> Finally. Somebody knows how to play the word game that we like to play here on oh, the yes. podcast. That's just how we talk, uh, not on a podcast. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, this one's, they're all really fun. I tried to pick out ones that are costume related. This one starts, hey, Luce, Pete, and all the lanterns out there. Love the pod. I discovered it a couple weeks ago. I joined the ghoul gang by episode two. Heck yeah. And I binged all the episodes. This is the best way to get into the spooky season feels. Thanks for all you do for building this wonderful community of people. Aw, you're welcome. We're so happy to have you in the ghoul gang. Okay, hopping back into the letter. There's a lot I'd love to share, but I'll start with my better half and our aesthetically spooky love story. We met in the midst of COVID, so naturally, plague doctors became our relationship mascot. <laughs> we really connected over our morbid senses of humor. So our first Halloween together, we dressed as plague doctors just for a small COVID-safe family Halloween party, but we went all out. We got dark Victorian-styled outfits and beautiful custom-made masks from Higgins Creek on Etsy. Then we finished it off with vintage black and white umbrellas and a glowing lantern. I'll include pictures. Ooh. The pictures are very good. I'll put them on the Instagram. I won't go all romancy on you, but needless to say, I fell head over heels for the man. We quickly got engaged and we planned our wedding in three months. I ordered custom Plague Doctor figurines to use as our cake toppers. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so cute. Huge shout out to Kit Kat Designs on Etsy. She even added a veil to my spooky doctor. It was beyond perfect. Aww. Check out her shop for adorable spooky micro sculptures. Such great recommendations in this letter. Our wedding was only days after Halloween, so of course we had to dress as Frankenstein and the bride for Halloween parties. We did a slightly more modern take, complete with leather jackets and combat boots. We had a blast and won the best couple costume at the party. Oh my goodness. 
We got married outside on a rainy, foggy November day, complete with a live cello player and our bridesmaids and groomsmen in full black. It was a perfect spooky fall wedding, in my opinion. Our plague doctor masks adorned our sweetheart table. We wore our leather jackets at the reception, and we incorporated I'm Your Boogeyman by White Zombie and The Four Horsemen by Metallica into our night. (laughs) (laughs) It was definitely the best day of my life. I'm a bit of a black sheep in my family, and though they love me unconditionally, it was really my husband who accepted me and encouraged me to embrace my spooky side. He loves me as I shamelessly wear my Halloween clothes in the high heat of summer and while we binge horror movies and eat all things apple or pumpkin. Now I get to have this new community of spooky nerds who understand that for some people, Halloween is just a way of life. Absolutely. Wow. What a letter. Thank you so much. And I'll put these up on the Instagram, but look how beautiful these pictures are. That painted such a beautiful aesthetic painting in my brain. Yes, yes. Your descriptions were so perfect. And these Plague Doctor masks are exquisite. The detail is incredible. There's filigree all around both of them. Mm -hmm. There's a white one and a black one, and they both have their own little flair to it. And their Frankenstein in the Bride costume is super cute, too. So cute. I really aspire to have... Such a, a beautifully aesthetic, streamlined love. I know, <laughs> right? And, um, you know, today, the day that we're recording, one of our Ghoul Gang members, uh, Teresa McCobb, who's an incredible Halloween fine artist, uh, it's her and her husband's, I think, fifth anniversary. So happy anniversary to them. Ooh, happy anniversary. <laughs> and they got married on the, it was the 13th um Oh my God, Friday the 13th in October, five years ago. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. So they so got, fun. yeah. So they got married on that day and they had like this, she had this beautiful black wedding gown, oh, these gorgeous fall flowers in her bouquet. And they're just both in black. So gorgeous. Oh my gosh. I love an unconventional wedding dress. Me too. Especially a black wedding dress. I think it looks so good. Yes, I totally agree. And I love that people, so many people in this community have. Had these really cool either spooky themed weddings throughout the year or October mm-hmm. weddings. Uh, Teresa doing it on Friday the 13th is so cool. Yeah. The um, attention to detail within this community is top notch. Yeah, it's really impressive, <laughs> right? And I just, I can't get over their really cute Plague Doctor masks that The work. cutest Plague Doctor masks of all time, might I add. I know, because I think Plague Doctor masks are pretty scary. The long beak. They're terrifying. Yeah. But then seeing their uh, grooms, their whole wedding party, essentially, in black. So pretty. This gorgeous fall sky behind them. It just looks like it was the uh, perfect day. Oh my gosh, if this was 2014 Tumblr and I saw that picture, <laughs> I would reblog. Yeah, definitely reblog. So check out It's Always Halloween podcast on Instagram to see these pictures. And thank you so much for writing in. Um, I'm not sure if I should use your name or not, so I haven't, but incredible. Uh, congratulations on finding the love of your life during such a difficult during such a difficult time. I myself am having a difficult time. <laughs> I'm I'm at the point uh, where I'm like, I'm going to take these teeth out myself. Yeah, maybe that's that'd be spooky. That would be a scary Halloween thing I could do is have Isaac just get pliers on my teeth. Yeah, yeah. You know, you don't need fake blood around the house. Just (laughs) your mouth bleeding. My mouth will bleed on everything. Oh, fun, free, easy way to celebrate Halloween. Yeah, a little life hack for everyone out there with teeth. (laughs) With teeth (laughs) that are giving them a hard time and making it difficult to speak. Um. I mean, really, everybody has been so awesome this month. I'm like, for the last several weeks, I'm like, I'm sorry, uh, my mouth hurts. I'm barely doing anything. And everyone's sending the sweetest mm-hmm. little well wishes That's to me. so nice. I think last time I was here, I was here a year ago, hanging out with you, making surprise. That was right before I got my wisdom teeth out. And That's I was right. having wisdom teeth pain the whole time. That's so we right. switched. We did switch. Wow, we're <laughs> bad luck charm on each yeah, other. Yeah, so fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you ever been to a Halloween-themed wedding? Oh my God, no, but I would love to. I love weddings. I love an event. Me Any too. event and a themed event, I'm in. I've never been to a Halloween wedding. No. I mean, 
it, that would probably be, I guess, just one of us would be the friend that throws the Halloween wedding. Yeah. So that's why we haven't been to one. Well, people ask me if I would do a wedding during Halloween. And I actually, I don't know if I was to get married again. I don't know if I would do it. Mm-hmm. during Halloween because selfishly I want every day of Halloween to be like my own thing that I'm doing that's true I mean or maybe like for me I would just double down and be like wedding my birthday Halloween it's all about me okay all the time. so you just do it all in the one day and be like everything that matters happens on this day yeah but then I'd be really disappointed if like I didn't get the whole world you know of course it's it's really hard when you don't get the whole you world. gotta spread the selfishness out a little bit a little <laughs> yeah good Halloween tip yeah a little Halloween tip for you um Okay, this uh, eek mail has the subject line, the shift in attitudes towards Halloween. As a 70-year-old, I recall Halloween being observed in the 1950s and early 1960s, usually only by children who participated by dressing in mostly handmade costumes, which may or may not have included said children wearing bandit-type half-face masks of stiffening gauze material. Some children wore store-bought costumes, but in my northeastern Ohio small town, those were not the norm. Halloween was pretty much a one-night affair, and children's Halloween parties were not part of that period. My question is this. When did the shift towards adults observing Halloween take place, and what do you think created it? At one point, the 18 to 20-something crowd, and then older adults clearly became active participants in Halloween, even though they had usually not done so. Did the shift toward adult appreciation of Halloween begin with the adult gay community in the United States, and as that community became more mainstream transparent? Was the dressing in costumes a metaphor for having lived a life involving that masquerading of a person's true self? If so, when did that involvement shift to participation by the straight community, and what accounts for that having transpired? In 70 years, Halloween has grown from a two- to three-hour event in one night, one night a year for children of ages 4, 5, to 13, to it always being Halloween for every age group. Certainly, the obvious commercial aspects and gains have made Halloween palatable and even favored by the business community. However, at what point did this positive shift towards Halloween occur, and what truly turned it into a celebration for all rather than a mere observation by children? Anyhow, keep up the beautiful work. I know the pace you keep can be positively ghouling. <laughs> Love that one. Yeah, that one's from my mom. <laughs> Hi, mom. Thank you for sending in such a detailed and thoughtful letter. Yeah. Yeah. So I think what's interesting about this is you're kind of using the perspective of your childhood in the mid-century when it definitely was more child-focused. But if we go back further than that, we actually do see Halloween as an adult festival. Mm -hmm. So from antiquity until about the 30s, Halloween was an adult festival. So it took different it took different forms as being like a harvest festival, a New Year celebration, um, a cultural celebration. When the Irish brought it to the United States, it became it was a lot more about uh, lots of partying and pranks and wagons getting thrown up onto houses, <laughs> uh, which made the Victorian Americans, the Europeans who had already, you know, been living in America for a generation or so, really bummed, super weren't into Halloween. And that's when they tried to kind of turn it into a more romantic party. Uh, Women coming over and playing fortune telling games to see if they could figure out through these games who their future husband might be. And it was also around that point that haunted houses started to be built in people's homes and churches for like fun, you know, extending the party atmosphere. So this was teenagers and young adults, uh, unmarried young people. Mm -hmm. And then as we get into the 30s, that's when, that's when there's a surmising that it became a little more focused on children. There's this thought that because so many people were out of work during the Great Depression and things were so tough, there were a lot of young men And teens just like running around, getting into craziness. Mm -hmm. And there were pranks that really went over the top into pretty serious vandalism, including a craze where 
um, they would band together to push streetcars off their tracks and sometimes killing uh, people who are on the streetcars. Oh, my God. And so this is all in America at this point in the 30s. So that's when communities were really working towards either banning Halloween outright as mm -hmm. like this is a dangerous night of mischief. Yeah. That's not fun or cute. Uh, to saying like, okay, well, why don't we start doing, that's kind of when they were coming up with like the trick or treating, like, let's have these parties, let's mm -hmm. keep the children focused, let's keep people busy. So that's kind of when we see trick or treat, Halloween parties, uh, Halloween parades be a little more focused on young people and having the community of parents and spiritual and educational leaders really set up society and Halloween to be something focused on young people. Mm, that's so interesting. So, mom, <laughs> you, you write in from the perspective of growing up, having it be a children's holiday, but you just grew up right in the smack of that becoming a children's holiday. So mm. if you would have been born in the 1900s, you probably would have seen it more as a teen holiday or a young adult holiday. So if you would have been born in the 1800s, you would have seen it as a everybody holiday focusing more on like the drunken antics of adults that we'd mm. all gather and bob for apples and play the fiddle and dance and everybody from town would come. You know, so just like every cultural celebration, it's changed uh, from country to country and from every decade and every major cultural shift. So I think that it just comes and goes in waves, right? Yeah. So it's really more towards the, I think the 90s when I think you nailed it, the business aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Anytime anything becomes profitable, then it's going to be accepted until it's not profitable anymore. Right. Uh, and you did bring up a really interesting point about the gay community. And I want to read an excerpt from this article from The Advocate. And the title is, There's a Reason Why Queer Folks Love Halloween So Much. This is a great article. It's by Tyler Curry. And I'll link it in the show notes for those of you who want to read the full article. But Tyler writes, Many queer and trans kids grew up having to wear a mask, and to many of us, every day was Halloween until we opened those closet doors. We are highly trained at hiding our true selves, so the celebration of costume and disguise is a natural marriage for us. But for today's generation, where queer is hardly the horrifying pronunciation that it once was, this explanation may no longer carry much weight. The main reason Halloween is a national LGBTQ holiday is the fact that being queer or trans is an extension of expressing who you want to be, in spite of who fears it. Regardless of how liberal the community you live in may be, the global reality is that being any part of the LGBTQ community is still considered a perversion, a subversion, and even an abomination. Some of us may rarely have to address this reality, living in progressive hubs where queer is practically the norm. However, others know all too well that a disturbingly large number of people in the U.S. still think our, quote, lifestyle is to blame for all that's wrong with the world. But Halloween is the one time of year when everyone is allowed to be whoever they want to be. Even boring, straight, cisgender folks go queer for a night and walk on the wild side. <laughs> Those who feel that they have to be in the closet for the rest of time can bust out in all their glory on Halloween. And anyone questioning their current identity has the chance to try another one out in public without fear of reprisal. When dawn breaks, some of those folks will have to turn back into pumpkins while we fairy godmothers get to keep being fabulous. Okay, I really like that excerpt a lot because this kind of ties back around to what you were saying earlier in the episode, Emma, about how costuming in general and then Halloween by extension is about exploring one's identity. Yeah, for sure. I think that it is kind of about, um, it, it gives people an opportunity to explore queerness um, and explore um, gender um, explore all kinds of things and just explore their style and their interests. Um, and so I think that's kind of where the queerness of Halloween comes into because it is about having an opportunity to explore new things and um, you can be uh, your true self in a way, even if it appears that you're hiding behind 
a costume. Um, it gives you an opportunity to try something new. Um, and so I do think that while Halloween is an opportunity to explore the fringe and for people that feel that they are a part of the fringe to really shine, um, it's not necessarily like the fringe influencing the greater culture. It's more for people to explore the fringe. Right, like we're all being invited in. Yeah, we get to be invited in for the night to be silly. And yeah, not and as wild be, as you want yeah, to be. Wherever you are in life, whether you are, you know, a super, you know, clean cut businessman, you know, for Halloween doesn't matter. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And in that way, again, I really, it's one of the reasons it's my all time favorite holiday is because there is so much room for exploration of oneself and it doesn't have to be that deep. You can just mm -hmm. be like, oh, I like little Bo Peep. So I'm dressed right. up as little Bo Peep. Like not everything is a deep psychological exercise, of course, but there are elements to that in costuming and masking. And I do think it's fascinating the way that culture ebbs and flows. And I, the fact that there is more acceptance for the queer community definitely does influence culture to an extent. Mm -hmm. But like you said, I think it's just because queerness and Halloween are sort of linked. Yeah, it's linked in the sense of it's about... Uh, exploring your yourself and there's also a sense of um there's being freedom. anonymous yes. as well and oh, it I gives you more that. freedom yeah uh i think halloween you know that's why masks i think were so prevalent it was about being anonymous so you could do these little silly pranks you know yeah absolutely and, and so, why pranks was such a big part of the holiday for so long totally and that's yeah. kind of trickled into now being able to explore all kinds of things through being anonymous in a way. Yeah. And I think too, we see the um, more excitement around mainstream excitement, I should say, and mainstream celebration of drag culture as For well, sure. because drag is so much about being over the top and having fun with costumes and really playing on ideals, ideas of uh, gender performance. And how can I amp up something that's like a little silly about femininity mm -hmm. and feminine expectations into this like large over the top character? For sure. And I think that, like, there is a release that people can experience watching mm -hmm. something like RuPaul's Drag Race. And that there's a reason now that there are just as many straight people as queer people that watch that show. It's not mm -hmm. necessarily a niche anymore. For sure. And straight people exploring drag. And exploring Absolutely. gender. Well, and because those two aren't necessarily overlapped. Yeah. That uh, gender and sexuality are different things and that you can play mm -hmm. with those and not have it mean something forever about yourself. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fluid. And that's the great thing about Halloween. It's kind of like for someone who's dipping their toes into exploring a side of themselves or just wants to express a side of themselves. Um, that they feel to be true, that they can. Yeah, they it's an to. opportunity. Yeah. And I think that's what's nice about making Halloween more of like an all-month thing. Oh, yeah. Is you have more opportunities to do that than just on like one night. Yes. And I do think the move towards celebrating Halloween, I mean, I can only say this from my perspective, which has been, you know, following Halloween bloggers and people on the internet, finding those communities in the early 2000s, and realizing that, like, man, we really want to start celebrating in September. And then realizing, like, oh, we don't really like summer because a lot of us are, like, goth and punk leaning. <laughs> so we actually would really rather start in August. Like, some of that is just the passionate people who love the holidays wanting to have more time with the holiday. And I do see that reflected in businesses. But businesses mm -hmm. didn't necessarily start selling things in July. I think that they saw us online saying hashtag code orange when am I gonna find like yeah the first who's gonna drop Halloween stuff first mm -hmm. there, start, there starts to be like a market following the demand the only time I agree with massive corporations is when they start putting out Halloween stuff much earlier than yes but Halloween. the trick is they have to keep it through October that's what they can't seem to figure out yeah so then I don't like them anymore after that yeah it's a very short-lived love affair yeah as it should be <laughs> Um, okay, great. I have another one here from a lantern named Emily, and the subject line is my Halloween in the cemetery. Ooh. I think the first year one decides to skip trick-or-treating is always memorable, for better or for worse. When I was 15, I was feeling too old for trick-or-treating. 
I went when I was 14, but with no younger siblings, I could tell from the faces of some of the adults that I was already too old for their liking. (laughs) I've had that moment. (laughs) I know. I was tall really early on, so So I was getting that trash in like elementary school. Yeah. A few houses didn't even give me candy at all. I was relieved when my friend Fee invited me to tag along with her and her Halloween plans. She was going with some friends to spend Halloween in the cemetery. It didn't feel right to not dress up for Halloween, but I was worried that no one else would have a costume on, so I wanted to put something together that I could take off if I needed to. Smart. Yeah, really (laughs) thinking ahead, that like scared teenage brain of not wanting to be ostracized immediately. Yep. 15 is hard too, because that's an age where like so much of your life has been being a kid and you still feel like a kid in some ways, but now Mm -hmm. you're surrounded by like 18 year olds and people who are trying to be like adults. Oh yeah. Yeah. 14, 15 is a difficult limbo. Definitely. I feel like I very much relate to the vibe of this story. Yeah. So you're going to love her costume. So using three hair bands and some pipe cleaners, I made myself Medusa hair. Oh my God. So clever. I cinched a belt around a white dress, and it looked Greek enough to me. (laughs) (laughs) At least I didn't feel out of place on the walk to the cemetery because I was passing by all the kids in their costumes. I shouldn't have worried, though, because everyone did dress up. Yeah. Fee was Wednesday Adams. Jenna had a Fantasia hat on. Cole painted his face like a skull and wore a hoodie. Judah was Ian Malcolm from Jurassic Park with just a black pants, shirt, and a leather jacket and fake glasses. Very cute. Frank wore a ripped up dress shirt with fake blood and carried an axe. And Paxton's costume was the most memorable. A Freddy Krueger costume that he threw together last minute. The sweater was spot on, but instead of a brown fedora, he had a black bowler hat. The face was done with marker. And instead of the knife glove, he just had a hook hand from a pirate costume. I love the dedication, though. He's like, this is the vision. We have to do it. (laughs) We could all tell what he was going for, but it was just so off. We had a huge laugh. (laughs) That's pretty funny. When I was invited, I thought the cemetery would be open, but apparently they're almost never open at night. I was the only one surprised by this. Everyone else knew we'd be jumping the fence to get in and had dressed for it. It took two friends to help me over the fence, and it's only thanks to Judah's leather jacket that my dress didn't rip on the spikes at the top of the fence. Oh my gosh, I've always been too scared to hop fences. Yeah, because I know I'm going to rip whatever I'm wearing. or my skin. Yeah, tetanus (laughs) issue. I had brought a flashlight but was told not to turn it on because we'd get caught. All we had was the moonlight and the stars. Once inside, we didn't have a present destination. We just wanted to get away from the fence in case any authority figures were checking the perimeter for trespassers. As we made our way deeper in, Frank and Cole kept lagging behind so they could split off from the group, run ahead, and hide behind trees and tombs to jump out at us. (laughs) I'll admit, they got me. I jumped, but in a weird way, it was comforting. It felt like it was in the Halloween spirit, and it made me less sad about missing trick-or-treating. I know, it's so cute. When we couldn't see the fence anymore, we stopped and sat on some graves and just talked. Jenna brought candy to share with everyone. Costumes, jump scares, candy, all the staples of Halloween were there. I don't know if it was planned as the goal of the evening or if it just seemed like the natural thing to do in the middle of a dark cemetery on Halloween night, but we spent most of the night telling scary stories. Ghosts, killers, aliens, mysterious deaths, it was all fair game. We also spent a lot of time just chatting and getting to know each other. We all had at least one friend there, but most of us didn't know each other until that night. Some chats ended up in pairs that went on walks together. I should end the details there. (laughs) But she doesn't. (laughs) Thank you. Even 25 years later, some youthful indiscretions should stay private. (laughs) I'll just say that skipping (laughs) trick-or-treating wasn't the only thing I did for the first time that night. (laughs) And after that, I have something in common with Mary Shelley. Wow. Smiley face, Emily. Emily. Emily's like, listen, I'm not going to tell you, but here's exactly what I did. Yeah. I'm going to be coy, but I mean, if you're really asking, (laughs) you really want to know. 
Emily, what an incredible story. You yeah. took us there. Yeah, no, the memories, the the Halloween vibes sounded like they were truly impeccable vibes. Yeah, I want to I want that to be my Halloween this year. Yeah. That's the stuff that's hard to recapture. That feeling of like I'm out on my own for the first time. Mm-hmm. This is kind of wrong, but it's also pretty innocent. They weren't doing it. They weren't defacing anything. They weren't doing yeah. anything. They were really just like being silly. I'm pro being a teen and trespassing into a graveyard. Yes, absolutely. As long as you're not knocking them over or, you know, doing anything mean. Having a little, like, picnic. A little picnic, a little little, Mary Shelley sesh. Yeah, a little sesh. (laughs) But I really wanted to read this one because I thought the Freddy Krueger look was just so funny. And it connects to what we were saying earlier about not being so addicted to perfection and treating every Halloween like it's a cosplay event. Yeah, it's so... I feel like that really captured the essence of, I think... What Halloween is at its core and what, you know, costumes can be. They don't have to be um, anything, you know, they, yes. they can be whatever they are. And if you do pull together a Freddy Krueger outfit like that, you don't have to feel bad that it's not an exact replica of what was in the film. That's not what it's about anyways. And yes. I think that's what it's about. You know, you can do something extravagant or you could do something that's just, you know, within your means and what you have around you and last minute fun costumes. Um, as long as you feel good about it, you don't have to feel bad about either one. Yeah. That's the thing. You shouldn't feel bad on Halloween. Exactly. Uh, and in that spirit, we have one more here. This is from Melanie. Hey there, I just wanted to reach out and share a little Halloween adventure of 2022. In many episodes, people talk about making their costumes and also how people can sometimes struggle to afford their costumes, especially now with the rising cost of living. I must say that I myself have been stressed about money and time this year. Everything I got for me and my three kids has been store-bought, but I am custom making my dad's costume. He and my boyfriend are going as Jason and Freddy. (laughs) I'm doing my boyfriend's makeup and I'm doing a little dressing up on his existing wardrobe that was store bought. But I'm going full out DIY with my dad's stuff and I've spent less making his stuff out of anything else and it looks the best out of everyone's costumes so far. I just wanted to show what love and dedication can look like. The value of this mask went from $6 to $25. I'm also going to add things on his jacket like moss and seaweed because Jason comes from the lake and detail is everything. So true. I'll send you more pictures when everything is completed. And we'll throw these up on the Instagram too. But Melanie just bought a white hockey mask and then she distressed it. And it looks like he's been in the lake for 20 years. It looks so good. I it looks mean, incredible. It looks like what a professional ager and dyer would do on that hockey mask. It looks like you followed suit, and I love the attention to detail with the moss. Yeah, the moss is really fun because you don't see a lot of Jason's covered in moss. Yeah, and I love, like, projects or even when, I mean, when you're costume designing for a film, too, you want to think about... The tiny details, like, would this person have been sitting down for two hours so their skirt would be wrinkled? Or would there be moss all over this mask because he was in the water? Like, it's it's attention to details like that. You know, if you are looking to, you know, revamp a costume or do something really unique or you're trying to do a replica of something, this is a great example. Like, her mask is a great example of doing just that. Oh, fantastic. Well, then check out our Instagram to see exactly what we're talking about. And please send in your own DIY costuming looks. Yeah, We'd love to see what you guys are creating this year in your creative, beautiful little minds. Okay, well, Emma, this was a nice, long costuming discussion. Thank you so much for coming to the pod bedroom and (laughs) sitting down with me to tell me a little bit what it's like being a costume designer, building your career, and how costume designing affects Halloween costume designs and kind of seeps into all of our psyches. Yeah, of course. I'm so happy I got to be on this podcast. Yes, thank you. This was so fun. And, uh, you know, you were on my last podcast. You need to see this. Yes, I was. And you and the other Monstrous Femme film girls came on and we discussed one of your favorite 
horror movies that you've also done some incredible costuming for. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Prom Night 2. Wait, what is it? Hello, Mary Lou. Prom, Prom Night, Night 2. 2. Which is not affiliated with Prom Night 1, except that it's in the same franchise. Story-wise? It has nothing to do with the Jamie yeah. Lee Curtis Prom Night. Absolutely not. It's way um, more fun. Way more fun. A great gateway horror film, if you want to get into, like, fun 80s. Or like I think any anyone that's looking for a fun spooky movie would honestly have a great time because it's spooky, it's a little supernatural, it's a little bit of a slasher. Um, and but there's it's like, not like wildly violent. No, and it's pretty fun. Yeah, it's just like cool women in cool outfits. Yeah, um, and a rocking horse that comes to life and is like kind of sensual in a weird way. Very yes, very strange rocking horse vibes. <laughs> Has like a tongue that comes. I don't know. It's a whole thing. Yeah, there, if you you gotta tune in for the rocking horse tongue. Yeah, at least watch it until that. I will put that episode in the show notes if you want to hear more Emma. And of course you do because she's very smart and talented. Um, (laughs) Good luck with the screening tonight. I'll (laughs) be there. So I get excited to get to see you in a few hours. Yes, I will see you in a few hours. (laughs) Um, Thank you so much to everybody for tuning in. Uh, This episode, we couldn't have made it without the Lanterns who contributed today. Melanie, my mom. (laughs) Emily and more. So if you want to send in any letters or you want to call the All Hallows hotline and share what you're doing with your costumes this year or any of your favorite costumes from the past or heck, any Halloween memories that you want us to read here, give us a call at 802-532-DEAD or write us that eek mail at it's always Halloween podcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Instagram at It's Always Halloween podcast. And if you love It's Always Halloween, please consider subscribing to us on Patreon and helping us produce every episode. You can find us at patreon.com slash it's always Halloween. You can also support us with a one-time tip or buy our merch on Redbubble. All those links are in the show notes, as well as the link to order your copy of The Lantern's Way, our very first Halloween made in collaboration with Joe Carlo from Displaced Snail. Go to the show notes or visit displacedsnail.com slash it's always Halloween. My specific tooth pain makes S's. Like I I have, I've re, I've like recalibrated my lisp from childhood and I'm like, I'm bringing it back. I'm having so much trouble with it. So thank you to everybody who sent in my well wishes. Um, I hope that, I sound better in future episodes with a few less teeth. Every episode of It's Always Halloween is written, researched, and performed by me, your forever haunted host, Luce Tomlin Brenner, with editing, sound design, and memorable, beautiful, terrifying theme music by the incomparable Pete Burns. Thanks, Pete. You can subscribe to It's Always Halloween everywhere, and please leave us a friendly, loving review if you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, five stars, of course, that bumps us up in the algorithm and makes it so that other like-minded ghouls can find us. Remember, we're also on the NPR One app, so subscribe there and tell Ira Glass you love us. Thank you so much for listening to yet another episode of It's Always Halloween. And come back next time, unless you're too busy admiring your cool skirt and you get caught and smashed in a garage door. Music